Um, today I would like to, to start actually with, uh, with an example uh, how, uh, of, uh, of showing you how to uh, derive certain theorem which you are uh, very familiar with. Uh, but before, before uh, I do this, I wanted to make an announcement about uh, the homework because a lot of you did not follow the instructions how the homework is supposed to be uh, submitted. Uh, it's, it is not important uh, for me that you give me the answer. I can, first of all, uh, I can find usually the answer uh, in uh, my, myself and uh, or sometimes at the back of the chapter uh, or at the back of the book. So really more important is the solution um, and it is supposed to be, uh, I really want you to exercise preparing reports, uh, articles, uh, proposals, so uh, the homework has to be uh, uh, prepared also in such a format. Well, so one f first thing is that I want every problem on a separate page. And the reason for the separate page because you should write enough text to fill up one page. Because some of you submitted homework with four problems on one page. Uh, and, and actually, uh, uh, well, there are no justifications, there, there are just formulas. Su some of you even submitted those formulas distributed v randomly. So, so it is, it's impossible really to track uh, uh, how did you solve. It, your solutions have to look ex the same way as example problems in the chapters. Right? Now try, try now to write f for example, fr four uh, example problems on one page. All right. Um, so uh, be because um, I will return the, the first homework uh, Tuesday, uh, it, uh, well, I wanted you to take into account um, when you are preparing homework number two, because there is already homework number two, which is uh, due uh, this Monday. All right. Yes. Well, uh, uh, refresh, uh, refresh. The, if you don't see it, it, it means that actually your browser does not download the page, but, but it has in the cache. So click the refresh button on the browser to make sure that, that you download the page from the, uh, from the server. All right. Um, now, <laughs> We, uh, yesterday we discovered that uh, magnitude of, an, of a vector, a magnitude, I mean, if we consider arrows as the vectors, uh, so magnitude of that arrow is equal to the length of that arrow. Well, I'd like to, uh, to apply it to a certain, to a certain theorem. Let's say that I, I take a triangle like this. And let's say that I know this length and this length and this angle over here. What is the length of the other uh, of the remaining side? Uh, some of you know this as a certain theorem, right? Who knows what is the uh, the length of that uh, of that other side? Well, definitely you know it if that angle alpha were. Uh, 90 degrees, right? If this angle were 90 degrees, well, we'll have a triangle like that. And can you find, uh, if you know A, B, the uh, fact that this is 90 degrees, what is the length of uh, side C? S square root of the square of the other two lengths, right? Now, how about that? Who knows that? No, it's not the same thing. Yes? A times the length of A, A yes. Yeah, there is something in that formula. Right, something like that. And it is known as the law of cosines, correct. Mm -hmm. um, well, how, how, how about if we derive it? Uh, well, so I will now think that 
uh, I will consider that th make an arrow from this side and an arrow from this side and an arrow from the third side. Uh, so, <coughs> how, about, how about if I put now arrows above these? Uh, I can recognize that arrow A is equal to arrow B plus arrow C. Or, so for, for arrow C over here, at C is equal uh, A minus B. Now, length of this arrow happens to be equal to the magnitude of this vector, right? So C is equal mag magnitude of vector C, of arrow C, and arrow C happens to be this difference And, uh, well, uh, can you refresh uh, my memory how to find magnitude of a vector? How? Oh, well, we know, we cannot use, uh, we have to use the length. We don't say that it is length. Yeah, indeed, it is the length of magnitude of vector C is uh, equal to the length of them, but I don't know the length. Square root of? Well, we have to square the vector first and then take square root of it, right? So, which vector do we have to square? We have to square this difference, uh, which means that I have to take vector a minus b and multiply it by a minus b. Now, we already know three multiplications. Which multiplication should I use? Uh, consult with your neighbor which multiplications we know, so, so, so that we, we know which, which one to use. Can you help me? Uh, uh, well, we have a... Okay, yeah, now have a, bra a brainstorm. Yeah, what did you say? Yeah, okay, we have, we can, yeah, so we, we know how to multiply numbers. Uh, we know how to multiply vectors. Actually, we know one more thing. How to multiply number and a vector, correct. All right, so which one do we have to use here? Vector times vector, all right. We haven't learned uh, yet that we have two multiplications of vector and vector. We learned so far one. So for you uh, right now there is no ambiguity. However, in the future I don't want you to call uh, that product that it's vector times vector. Because it is vector times vector using scalar product. The result of multiplication of two vectors using scalar product is a number. number. Correct. I had a question there. Correct. I have vector A minus vector B. Number, no. no. Here we have. Here I'm adding vector vectors. When I add a vector to a vector, I get a vector. Now that minus actually means that I'm adding here. A, yeah, I, I skipped already the formation, uh, the uh, notation that it is. I'm adding a vector opposite to vector B. Uh, yeah, because in principle, the way I got this equation from this equation, I added to both sides vector minus b. Yeah, so in principle, I had plus minus b. All right, so uh, the, if I use unambiguous notation, uh, I should put a circle over here. And uh, since this is magnitude, I have to take square root of this. All right, now properties, distributive uh, and associative properties of scalar product uh, makes it that uh, I have to multiply every term by every term using what, what multiplication? Shout. 
scalar product using scalar products I have vector a times vector a plus uh, oh, let's put uh, minus vector a times vector b minus vector b times vector a plus vector b multiplied by vector b right let's perform the multiplications if we multiply vector a by vector a using scalar product and recall that, that these are arrows so what will be the results uh, you will say a squared now which a squared uh, this way or this way the first one is who votes for the first one who votes for the second one you both are right <laughs> you both are right this symbol actually you have to recognize that it is scalar square of vector a although there is little progress with that because it's the same thing as the expression over here so indeed this expression is is better however where did we get this expression from because if we calculate vector a times vector a i have to take the uh, length of vector a multiply by length of vector a and multiply by cosine of the angle between these two what's the angle between them zero, zero degrees correct right now this a is the length do you see that so so over here i have the length in principle and because because actually it happens that it that uh, length of an arrow is equal to magnitude of that vector we don't even distinguish in the notation length of an arrow will have uh, will, for, for length of an arrow we are using symbol a and for magnitude of that arrow we use symbol a all right so for this one i will have a square now how about that one so it will be uh, length of uh, arrow a so it will be a times b times cosine of the angle between these two arrows which is alpha right and with minus sign uh, let's now go to this one there will be uh, length of b times length of a times cosine of the same angle so I will have two of those and uh, at the end I will have b square right so so here we have the law of cosines length of this side of triangle is equal to square root of square of this side of the triangle plus square of the length of this side of the triangle minus two times product of the two lengths multiplied by cosine of this angle here and if it happens that this angle is 90 degrees for the cosine of this i will have here cosine of 90 degrees and cosine of 90 degrees is zero which means that this term disappears and we derived what Pythagorean theorem right first we derived the law of cosines and then we derive uh, Pythagorean uh, theorem uh, all right um, Um, now based on the quiz actually I saw that you you are already getting really confused about vec vectors well I mean you were you didn't know anything about it before you came to the class so make sure that you thoroughly analyze it uh, and it is probably the most important uh, uh, chapter in the book because that this is a very general chapter uh, so make sure that you comprehend vectors and don't confuse uh, scalar components vector components uh, magnitudes of the vector and vectors themselves all right 
uh, concept of angle, uh, well, so far, the, the only way you understand concept of angle is, is angle, yes? Oh, thanks. The only way you understand concept of angle, angles is it's a geometrical uh, quantity. Uh, so we don't have a problem between uh, for the angle between arrows, but what is the angle between functions, for example, or, or some, some other uh, vector quantities? Well, by definition, I mean, we define them in such a way, well, we will see it, actually. This is the formal definition of an angle between two vectors, and I want you to remember this definition. With the definitions, we always have to learn them by heart. Uh, th th there is no logic why, why, why this thing is called chair. It, is simp it simply is. You have to be able to recognize. With the definitions, you also have to simply know that. All right, so let's see if we understand everything. So if we have two vectors, A and B, angle between them is inverse cosine or arc cosine of a quotient of scalar product of those two vectors divided by product of their magnitudes. This is by definition. Memorize this definition. Uh, let's, take, let's take a look at an example and find out uh, angle between two pairs. And so I have a pair 2 and 0 and 1, 1. According to the definition, this is how I would have to calculate that uh, that angle. So I take inverse cosine or arc cosine of and I calculate scalar product. Now if we have scalar components of a vector, oh well, uh, for pairs, uh, scalar, uh, scalar uh, product is, def we define it as a product of the first number and the first number uh, added to the product of the second number and second number. If we had an, an tuplet or, mo or more numbers, uh, then we would continue uh, calculating products of corresponding uh, numbers and adding them. All right, so scalar product of those two uh, pairs is 2, right? Now, I, uh, in the numerator, or denominator, sorry, I have to find magnitudes of those and then uh, multiply the magnitudes. So magnitude of vector a, I have to square vector a and take square root of that. Right, so the square of the first number plus square of the second number times square uh, and uh, square root of that. Uh, magnitude of the uh, second vector, it's square of the first number times square of the second number and square root of that. Um, well, so if I, if I calculate that, you can take your, your calculator I will find out that this angle is 45, uh, uh, 45 degrees. Actually, uh, well, you can easily see that, yeah, because in the numerator we have 2, and in the denominator we have how much? Uh, so this is 2 from here times square root of 2. Right, so 2 and 2 cancels, and it is 1 over square root of 2, or you can say square root of 2 over 2. You should recognize that, that it is cosine of, uh, square root of 2 over 2 is cosine and is, is equal to sine of 45 degrees. So inverse function will uh, give me uh, 45 degrees. Well, <laughs> Let's take a look at those, uh, I mean, and, and now let's take a look uh, at, uh, at an arrow whose scalar components are like that. Because right now I perform this operation completely independently of, of the arrows. But let's take a look at the arrows whose scalar components are like that. So this vector, well, it is along x-axis, and this vector is, well, goes diagonally, like that. Uh, what is the angle between these two lines? Also 45 degrees. Correct. This angle over here is also five, 45 degrees. Well, which means that the angle is defined in such a way that, uh, that it coincides with the angle between the arrows corresponding to, to those uh, 
to those two vectors. And, and it, is, it is going to be true for everything. If I consider forces, for example, angle between forces is going to be the same as angle between the arrows which we assign to the, for, to the forces, and so on. All right, now, uh, uh, I want to define a, a vector which is referred to as a projection of a vector in a particular direction. So if I have an arbitrary uh, vector A, and, as, and I pick a certain unit vector which indicates a direction, then uh, projection of vector A in the direction of vector E is equal to, well, we, I have to calculate scalar product of those two vectors and multiply this number by that unit vector. So let's take a look now at the direction, uh, what, what will be the direction of the projection? Consult with each other, in, can you say anything about the direction of this vector? How, this, how the direction of this vector is related to the direction of vector A and, and uh, E? Well, how about if I give you uh, <coughs> options? Yeah, so it will be A, B, and C. Uh, so I will say that the project that this vector is in the same direction as vector A. So this will be one answer. Uh, uh, the projection is going to be in the same direction as this unit vector. So this will be the second answer. And the third answer that the direction of this vector is different than the directions of the other two let's say in general. So, who votes for answer A, if, for the first answer? Who agrees that the direction of this vector coincides with the direction of vector A? Who thinks that the direction of the projection coincides with the direction of, uh, of that unit vector? This is the direction in wi on which we projected vector A, okay? Who thinks that it is completely different? The second answer was correct. Look at this. Uh, over here, if I multiply these two, what am I going to get? A vector or a number? Number, right? What, um, what multiplication are we using here? Scalar product, correct. What multiplication do we have here? Number and a vector. All right, if I multiply a number by a vector, I will get a vector in what direction? Direction of the vector which I'm multiplying. Yet, so two times, two times vector i is in the same direction as vector i. Five times vector j is in the same direction as vector j. Here I have a certain number multiplied by vector e. It means that it is in the same direction as, uh, as uh, vector uh, e. All right, uh, let's now take a look uh, at an example of projection. Yeah, so let's say that I will project vector a on, vec on the direction of vector i. Uh, so, first I have to calculate scalar product of those two vectors. So, what am I going to get? Well, it is, I will get uh, uh, length, I have to take length of this vector. Uh, let's say that it is just capital A without, uh, without an arrow, multiply by length of this vector. What is length of this vector? 1, correct, so it will be A times 1 times cosine of the angle between these two. Yeah, so this is A, angle here is phi, the length is going to be equal to the distance from, the, from this point to this point. This vector, therefore, is the projection, oh, uh, it may uh, jump too fast, but that's fine. Uh, so the scalar, the, the, this scalar product will give me this length. And if I multiply it by vector, by unit vector i, I will get a vector 
I mean precisely this vector. Therefore, this vector is projection of vector A on the direction of vector I. Is it clear? Consult with each other how we get projection so, so that you indeed recognize, I, because I know that the you are not familiar with this notation. So, so although you have all the knowledge to comprehend it, if you are not concentrated, you're just listening to me and think, well, I, will, uh, I, will, I know what he is talking about and I will learn uh, exactly what, what he said at uh, home. Try to do it here. Yes, yeah, so consult with each other that, that, to make sure that, that your neighbor and you understand it. Ha, what is a projection of a, vec of a vector? I think you, ha you understood this as a projection so far, right? Because probably you had it somewhere in, ge in, ge in geometry. Uh, this expression is more general. Now you can project a function on a function. Any type of a vector on a vector. All right, so consult with each other. Why, why aren't you... Uh, okay, good. <laughs> well... How about if we take a look at the application of it? Let's take a look at the application. I, I, uh, I want to bring up a theorem over here, which says that if I, if I uh, choose uh, mutually perpendicular directions, all, all directions, I mean, uh, uh, using the base of the, of the space, then Every, ve every vector in that space can be written as a linear combination of those mutually perpendicular uh, vectors. So, so here I actually repeated uh, the same thing as uh, sometimes, well, at the very beginning, when I said that every vector can be represented as a linear combination of vectors. So we have to choose certain numbers, A1, A2, and A3, to represent vector A as a linear combination of vectors i, j, and k. Now, each of those numbers, ax happens to be equal to scalar product of vector A and vector i. A2 it happens to be the scalar product between vector A and vector j. And az is equal to scalar product of vector A and vector k. Uh, yes, so the projection, the projections, and each of, each of those is a projection, so the projections actually constitute the vector components of uh, vector A. Let's take a look at an example, uh, which, <laughs> I mean, we will, this example illustrates actually how, uh, what we are going to do. Yes, so, <coughs> how we are going to find out scalar components, how we find scalar components of vector A. So let's say that I have vector A now. I introduce a coordinate system and look for scalar components of vector A. Well, x component is supposed to be equal to scalar product of vector A and vector I, which I didn't mark here. Yeah, but vector I is, in the x, is a unit vector in x direction. So if I perform calculation, I will get that, that x component is equal to uh, magnitude of vector A multiplied by cosine alpha. I mean, right now it is really, uh, for, for, for the arrows, it is length of arrow A, but I, I will start using the uh, word magnitude for, for, for length, recognizing that they are always equal. So I have, to, and magnitude, uh, it, if I say magnitude, it will be more general. So x for any vector, not necessarily arrow, uh, x component is going to be related to magnitude by this uh, uh, equation. I have to multiply magnitude by cosine of the angle which it makes with vector i, which means that it also makes with, with axis x in order to get x component. Uh, I had a question over here. Can you shout it? Correct. It's the other way around, actually. 
it is that we choose vectors i, j, and k, and then extending it, we reform axes x, y, and z. So axis x is always in the direction of vector i. Uh, I and this is kind of already a convention. This is by convention. Uh, because in general, I, it's probably it's better to say E1, E2, e, and E3, and so on. However, in this course, and consistently with the book, vector i is always going to be in the same direction as axis x. J is, J is always in y direction, and k is always in z direction. I have one more uh, uh, comment or question. Shout it. So Shout. Correct. Even, even, yeah, because I, yes, we don't, uh, we don't uh, mark vectors i, j, and k all the time. If we remember that uh, that the relation, the directional relationship, it's it becomes redundant. All right. Let's now take a look at uh, y component of vector a. How to find y component of vector a? Well, again, I have to find the projection of vector A on the direction of vector K, or the direction of axis Y. So I have to take uh, magnitude of this vector, magnitude of vector uh, I, which is 1, and multiply, multiply by cosine... Oh. oh, sorry, I went too fast. <laughs> this is vector component of vector... Uh, uh, x vector component of vector a. Yeah, over here we found a scalar component. Now recall that scalar component of vector uh, of a vector is a number. Vector component of a vector is a vector, and we get vector component by multiplying what by what? Which number? The scalar component of the vector by not by not by the vector component. In order to get vector component, we don't multiply scalar component by vector component. Scalar component would have to be 1 all the time. In order to find vector component of vector, and actually you have it here. Yeah, this, number, this number over here is the scalar component of vector x. A, a sorry. This is the vector component of vector a. So what do I multiply by what in order to get what? Uh, well, a cosine alpha is scalar component of vector a. Correct. This ax is the vector component of vector a. Okay. So I have to multiply scalar component of vector a by something in order to get the vector component of vector A. By what? Vector I, correct. I have to multiply it by the base vector, by the corresponding base vector in order to get vector component. Uh, <coughs> why, don't you, why don't you tell your neighbor now I mean, in, in here in the class, that in order to get vector component of a vector, you have to multiply <coughs> appropriate uh, base vector by the scalar component of this vector. Tell, tell this uh, to uh, uh, inform your neighbor about this important fact. Yes. I can't hear you. Have to shout. Shout. And we will get there. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. Shout your question. Is that A uh, in front of the cosine, the magnitude? Right. This A is the is the magnitude uh, of vector A. If it is an arrow, then it's the length of arrow A. But in general, it's the magnitude of vector A. Uh, now, 
yes, uh, right, shout out your question. Okay, so A times cosine is a number. Right? Correct. A times cosine alpha, this is a number. And consistently with the book, watch, watch the notation. If a letter is bold, it's a vector. If if we use if uh, if I use uh, our book uses regular letter, it's a number, correct? So here I have a a number multiplied by a number. I get a number over here. This is a vector and this is a vector because they are bold, bold letters. I use bold letters. Now I want you to warn something because. <coughs> uh, Although right now you know that you uh, I, uh, you know that you know more than one multiplication. How many do you know? Three. Three? Correct. But I know that you will be confusing them. Uh, so I'll, sh I'll show you which operations. Can I now? Can uh, how to solve? Uh, can I? You know, because I tell you a common error. Somebody will will be able uh, will probably write down an expression in uh, solving let's say for a by dividing this vector by cosine and vector i we have no division by vectors we don't know what one over a vector is it is undefined operation we know what is one over two so for example i can solve i for i from here by multiplying both sides by the inverse of this number then i will have here one over a cosine alpha times vector a x is equal to vector i however a on this side is not equal to vector a x divided by cosine alpha times i we don't know how to divide a vector by a vector so we know how to multiply a vector by a vector, but we, we don't have an inverse of a, one over a vector. Okay, I bet that you will still do it, but, but I will remind you that I warned you about it. However, I'm warning you about a lot of pitfalls, uh, so, so I understand that uh, you won't be able to, to, to remember all of it. Okay, let's now go to the vertical component. Yeah, so we, we, here, we thought we, here we got an expression. Wh what the symbol means? What does the symbol mean? Shout. This is a number. So, and this number, because it is AX, it is somehow related to X. What, how, I, how is it? N is it maybe magnitude of vector A? No. Do we have a symbol of magnitude on the screen? Yes. Yeah, there is somewhere magnitude of vector A. Where? A. This A represents magnitude of vector A. What, that, what, what this symbol represents? Vector component. Right? Wrong. Scalar component of vector A. Correct. Do we have a symbol for the vector component of vector A on the screen? Yes. Where? This one, correct. Right, do we have the symbol for, for the vector? On the screen, correct, over here. This is the symbol for, for, the, uh, for the vector. Uh, actually, I want, I want uh, uh, to indicate something, something uh, uh, one more thing, which actually uh, the book doesn't distinguish, although in my notes I do distinguish. When I talk about arrows, I use such a symbol for an arrow. Uh, so it's, n it's not a full arrow, it is half an arrow. I use this symbol for arrows. And you will see uh, in the future uh, why I'm using it. Uh, book doesn't, the book doesn't use it. Um, <coughs> understanding that the instructor actually will clarify that. So I think the clarification will be simpler if I make the distinctions. I will distinct an arrow representing a force or a physical quantity with the physical quantity. All right, let's now go back to the y component. Well, to the y component, I have to find scalar product of vector a and vector j, unit vector in the direction of uh, axis y. So it, I will have again magnitude of vector a multiplied by 1 times cosine of the angle. 
uh, between the two directions. Now, if it is uh, on, on the plane, then these two angles add up to 90 degrees and, uh, and therefore I can express cosine of angle beta in terms of sine of vector of uh, angle alpha. Cosine of, of this angle is equal to sine of this angle. And actually, you, you can even see it, I mean, from the geometry, yeah, because in, from the geometry, if you didn't see arrows, but just triangles, if you had this right triangle, cosine of this angle would require this length to be divided by the, this hypotenuse of this right triangle. Now, if I consider now this triangle, then this length over here happens to be equal to this, to this length, which means that I have to divide this length by the length of this hypotenuse. So it's the it's sine of angle alpha. Uh, all right, how would I write an expression now for the, y com for the vector component? Y vector component of vector A if I already found the scalar component of vector A. What do I have to do? Multiply this number by? by vector j, correct. I have to multiply by vector j and I get it. All right. Uh, now, for, for the next few weeks, we will be talking about objects which don't exist. Uh, however, they are useful. <laughs> uh, because with a very good approximation, we can, we can, and this is what we will be doing, we can use this object to approximate my body, for example. And, uh, and in many cases, you don't uh, care about the details of my body, so you can think that I'm this object. And this object is called a particle. Particle is an object which has a certain mass, is in the shape of a point. Well, <coughs> so approximating me as a particle you, th you would think about me that I am a point. So actually in the classroom I'm not particularly, uh, uh, I, I don't look exactly like a particle. However, if you get on the moon for example, or even not that, the, in the spacecraft, and you watch me f uh, from the spacecraft, I am a particle. Uh, <sighs> because from that distance you would see me just like a point. You wouldn't even know how, what is my orientation because since a uh, uh, particle is of the shape of a point, it means that it, has zero, that it has zero diameter and no internal structure. Well, if something has no internal structure, it means that I cannot rotate it. Yeah, because you wouldn't... How do you know that I rotate it? Yeah, because now you see my uh, right profile and now you see my left profile. Because I have this shape, you can recognize that I turned. Now, if I were a point and I did something like that, you wouldn't see it. I cannot, therefore, uh, rotate. Uh, well, in various situations, we approximate, we approximate a real objects by particles. Uh, and uh, we will actually learn one of, uh, of uh, in the future, learn, uh, one of theorems about uh, objects that a particular motion of an object is, uh, which is referred to as translational of uh, uh, motion of the object, we can associate it with the motion of a certain point associated with the object. We, it will be like at that point we concentrated entire mass of the object, uh, so like we squeezed uh, this uh, into uh, uh, the entire uh, substance of the object into this point and follow now how that point moves. That point is, we will uh, uh, learn in the future how to find that point, but that point is called center of mass. So when we approximate an object by a particle, think that it is at the center of mass of the object. Right now, think about that this is some kind of a geometrical center of, uh, of, a, uh, of the uh, shape. Uh, well, now I wanted really to get into uh, physics. So if we have, um, 
and and uh, show you what actually we do when we assign vectors to physical quantities. And as the example of physical quantity, I will take a position of a particle. So now think about position of a point. So here I have a particle. Note actually that I use a full arrow over here. That full arrow says that it's a physical quantity called position. To that position, I'm going to assign an arrow, and I'm going to assign actually a set of numbers. Now, however, to indicate that these are two different things, although we, we will get so accustomed to this that we will not even distinguish properly, I want to ask a question. In this if we have this configuration now, how many positions does the particle occupy? I mean, in how many positions a particle has? One. A particle has one position. All right. Now, in order to represent this position by an arrow, uh, we have to choose a certain another another point in space and draw an arrow I mean with that, an that another point is called the reference point so we need to, to pick a reference point uh, and well practically you will use you will use yourself you will almost automatically use yourself although although this is not uh, uh, required conditions and in principle you can choose whatever you want sometimes you will choose something else and then draw an arrow from the reference point to the location of the considered particle. So how many positions the particle uh, had, has? One, okay. How many arrows I can assign to that position? How many? As many as you want. As many as you want. Infinite number, how? Picking different reference points, point, right? So do you see now that the arrow position arrow is not the same as the position. Or po position vector is not the same thing as position. It is uniquely assigned though. Yes, so so if, I, if I choose a certain reference point and I think about a particular arrow, there will be only one position associated with that. Uh, uh, well, since we have, uh, I don't want to get into discussion, uh, l l let's uh, wait for that. Now, how about assigning numbers to that arrow? Yeah, because now how, uh, I have already shown you how to assign uh, uh, n uh, numbers to, to an arrow, scalar components to an arrow. What do we do? We, uh, yes, how, how do we assign them? Well, we choose vectors i, j, and k somehow in an arbitrary way, right? So we choose a coordinate system and then project that arrow on the three directions and uh, take scalar, uh, scalar components of this vector as the triad representing arrow, th that arrow. Well, in how many ways I can do that for a single arrow? Infinite. How? H how do you see that I can do it infinitely? A what? No, 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 we have already decided to, to choose a particular arrow, so which means that it, the reference point is already fixed. But we can change, we can choose vectors i and j and k differently. These, these uh, axes don't have to be the same way. Even, actually, if I even change, I put x, y, and z over here, I will have to permutate those, uh, those three numbers as well. I will have to change their order, right? So I will assign it a, a different arrow. But, I, but in principle, I can make a completely arbitrary orientation. Yeah, so you see that for a single position, I can assign a lot of arrows, and for a single arrow, I can assign a lot of triads or arrays. However, I, if, I'm if I'm consistent and stick to, to, to that procedure, so if I pick a reference frame somewhere, I have to remember that this is where I, I pick a reference frame. So if I draw, I will, I will uh, visualize the situation. And actually, use arrows to visualize situation. To do the, for, for performing calculations, use the assigned uh, numbers. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I think that at least for a while or, or probably even through the rest of, the, of, uh, of my notes, if you have a full arrow, symbol full arrow, it represents physical quantity. Uh, this type of an arrow above the symbol represents an arrow assigned to that quantity. And, and this symbol represents an array representing the quantity. Uh, so, this will be all for today. <laughs> uh, what?